this was one of your um, one of your problem set questions. I'm hoping it wasn't, but it's page 246, number 18. It says the following. Tell me, please, if you've done this already. An elevator went from the bottom floor to the top floor at an average speed of four meters per second. It stopped at the top for 90 seconds. It then returned to the bottom at five meters per second. The total time elapsed was four and a half minutes. How high is the tower? Did you do this one in the problem set already with an elevator? Which, which section? Would, which problem? It's section 58, number 18. What do you got, Max? 58. We did it for the homework, I think. For the homework? Uh, I'll use it as an example, though. You, and it seemed nobody recalled that as I was reading it. So an elevator goes from the bottom to the top of a tower at an average speed of four meters per second. So what do I start with in my mind? What am I doing? When I read this, what am I doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm visualizing stuff. I'm organizing my data and thinking about a picture. So I'm going to start with a picture. To the top, I know that the average velocity is four meters per second, or yeah, meters per second. It stops at the top. I'm going to call that T delay, a time of delay. And that was 90 seconds at the top. On the way back down, it goes at five meters per second. From the top back down to the bottom. So that's my picture painted already. It goes to the top at a given rate. It stops at the top for a minute and a half. It comes back down at a given rate. We're told that the total time is four and a half minutes. And the question says, determine the height of the tower. So I'm putting H there, which is fine, obviously. H for height. What do we use, though, in the formula we've been using all year? What do we use the formula? Yeah, distance, T, right? Now, if I look at a problem like this, it looks like I'm given information about the total time, some time in the middle there, a little delay, and I've got some other information there about the speeds themselves. Now, those speeds can somehow be related to time also, so let's write down all the things we know. So it looks like for me, if I'm doing this and I'm listing all my givens, I could also list V1, or R1 rather, I'm thinking physics for velocity, let's say R for rate, R1, and that's going to be 4 meters per second, and then R2 is going to be 5 meters per second. So I've got 4 and 5 meters per second. I don't know the time it takes. I know that the distance on the way up, though, fill in the blank, the distance on the way up, is half the? Not one half H. Two H? No. H? Yeah. H is the distance yeah. on the way up. It's not one half H. H is the height. Oh, so it's, the thing. it's half of the entire trip. But what else do you know? It's not about proportion. Not about proportion. It's about equality. Think about equality and not proportion. Yeah, it's equal to the way down. That's the key. I don't care whether it's half of H or whatever we call things. All that matters is that the distance on the way up equals the distance on the way down. That has to be known. If that's not known, we have too many unknown variables and we can't solve this. And that's one of the keys here, that D1 equals D2. Yes? I mean, I'm looking at the problem. Does the 90 seconds really like, do much? Like, can you just like, take that out of the problem and subtract that? From? From the 4.5 minutes. Absolutely, Rich, right? yeah. Just, just drop it off and say, you know what? It's three minutes, right? It's three minutes share time of motion. I agree, that works fine. Now, I'm going to show you how that works and how to incorporate it, okay? So let's say the time on the way up plus the delay plus the time on the way down equals the total time. Guys, I'm sorry, this thing is not working well. My pencil is not receiving this. I don't know why those things are coming up. <sighs> All right, time on the way up plus the delay at the top plus the time on the way down equals the total time. So as Bridge mentioned, he's right. This is 90 seconds right here in the middle, right? So this is really 1.5 minutes, and this is 4.5 minutes right here. These are unknown, T2 and T1. So as Bridge said, yeah, let's get rid of that. So we could see that already, that the total time on the way up and down is just three minutes. Yeah, absolutely, okay? So we're equating our times here. We're saying that the time of each second equals the total time of I. Get rid of the one and a half, and you delay, it's three minutes. Now, T1 or T2, which is bigger? Answer, go. Which is bigger, T1 or T2? T1 or T2? Why T1? Why is T1 bigger? Going more slower. Very good. It's going slower, so it takes longer. 
longer. T1 has got to be bigger. At least you have a sanity check of your answer, right? You have an idea of what it should be like. Now, how do I solve this? How do I solve this? It looks like T1 and T2 are both unknown. That's two variables and one equation. I can't do anything. What do you think? All right, so what's T1 really defined as? And what's T2 really defined as? Go ahead. What are they defined as? Get, what do you got, Luke? Okay, that's a relation to one another. Could be used, but there's an easier way to do it. There's an easier way to do it. It's possible to go that way, Luke, but I think there'd be a harder route. What else do you think? What do you got, Kate? Uh, D over R. D over R? Where's that coming from, Kate? D over R T. Yeah, look at the top right, please. D equals R T. If that's the case, solve for time. When you solve for time, you get D over R. So this is really just D1 over R1, and this is D2 over R2. I can take those definitions and plug them in. What's that? R2, D2, huh? nice, very nice. So we have D1 over R1, oops. Plus D2 over R2 equals three. Keep scrolling up a little bit. Now, be careful before I go any further. I want to point something out. It's really important to recognize units. Look at the units of your rate. What are the units of the rate? We got the R1 would be four meters per second and R2 would be five meters. So the units themselves are oh, meters, meters per second. Yeah. But my time is measured in what right now? Yeah. So I should probably convert that to what? Seconds. 180. So multiply by three. Replace this right here in the end with 180 because it's in seconds. Okay, this was really measured in minutes earlier. But you have to have the units agree. We're going to learn more about that in physics when you guys are juniors, okay? We'll hear more about that in physics and junior here. Now, D1 and D2 are the same, so call them just H. It's the height of the building. Whatever D1 is, it's just the height of the building. So this is H over 4 plus H over 5 equals 180. So the hardest part about this type of question is coming up with the equation. And then the solution is not as bad, actually, right? What do you need to do at this point? Find a common denominator. Common denominator. And multiply the whole thing through. So multiply everything by 20. Multiply everything by 20, please. It's the least common denominator, right? So 20h over 4 is going to be 5h. 20h over 5 is 4h. 2 times 18 is 36, and tack on the two zeros. Remember, these are units in seconds, so we're not too concerned about that number looking very large. 9h is 3,600. h equals 400 meters. Okay, the height of the building is 400 meters. Did we, I have a question for you, did we determine the time it takes to travel to the top of the building? Even though it was in the formula, we replaced T1 with D1 over R1. So this problem does not ask you for the time it takes. It asks you for the height. So it made sense to replace the time it takes with something involving the height. And then since D1 and D2 are the same, we just call them both H. Yeah, we call them both H. Any questions on a problem like this? You understand distance rate. Now, this, listen carefully, is very similar the problems where the person is rowing upstream and going downstream and it takes different times to do that. These problems are very similar in nature. They're analogous to one another, okay? They're also very similar to one where you have the airplane flying and partially with the wind and partially against the wind. The rate is R plus whatever and R minus whatever, whatever being the wind speed. So for the three-part problems, absolutely. Absolutely. The three-point problems, rather, I should say. The multiple choice, no. And then the short answer, only one point each. In the past, we have not given partial credit. I don't think we're going to. Okay. We're, we're tempted to, for, for the middle part. For this, yes, for, for a long answer, for your response, there is, if for correct work, partial credit is allowed. For correct work. What else, what else? It's 
It's up to you guys. What's something that you struggled with earlier in the year? Or something you want to review or something along the way on your old test? Yeah. Um, we go over like the quad drives, the like the graphing quadratics in vertex form. Okay, we got graphing quadratics in vertex form. So I'm going to start with my general form first, which could look like that, or it was written like this. Is there any difference here, folks? Any real difference here? What's well, f of x, really? Y. And the k just gets moved to the other side. Do we see how this is really the same thing, both of those, right? So you can approach this either way when you're looking at vertex form. So let, let's say the following. Let's say that... Mm hmm. Um... Okay, here's the wording. The maximum value of a projectile <coughs> in flight, I should say maximum height, really. Of a projectile in flight is 40 meters after being in the air for 3.5 seconds. <coughs> if, let me think, we need one more thing, right? Yeah. If it is at a height of 15 meters after one second determine the height function. Okay, determine the height function. Now, at first it seems like this would be a little bit confusing, but the height is a function of what here? The height of the ball is a function of what? What causes the height to change? As this changes, the height changes, fill in the blank. Time. As time elapses, the height changes, right? A projectile is measured in height as a function of time. And this follows a parabolic curve. Again, think about a projectile. You did this in the last project just now. You toss the object like that, right? It follows that path. So we're told the maximum height and a time it occurs at. How can I utilize that information? Max. It's the vertex. If I look at this as my graph, this here is really 3.5 comma 40. And this point over here is really 1 comma oops, 15. That's the key to a problem like this. This is an easy problem if you can recognize what you're given. When you're told the maximum on a parabola, that's the vertex. So since the max height was 40 and it occurred after three and a half seconds, that's my coordinate t comma h. And if I look at this, I could think of this as simply a graph as such. Okay, this is what the graph really looks like. This is what we're focused on. H is along the y-axis, and T is along the x-axis. It's usually written like that. Yeah? Wait, so once you find the points, do you have to plug them back into the equation, or how does that work? Like, so usually, remember, think about your, think about your, you guys, that last project, huge, huge to find. At this point, if you were given a third point, three points, you can plug them in and use a system. Remember, you guys did the system, you should be the ball shape right now, with a matrix. Okay, that's the other third point. If you have the intercepts, you can plug them into intercept form for R1 or R2, and then use another point to find an A value. If you have the vertex, which well, you should probably plug this into. Thank you. Vertex form, the third of the three. Okay, so vertex form tells me Y minus K equals A times X minus H squared. Remember. HK is the vertex. 
H is 3.5, K is 40. This is vertex form. Y minus K equals A times X minus H squared. Is that the answer? Am I done at this point? Hannah, why not? Because you need to find A. You need A. You need A. But A isn't given. Another point is given. What should I do with that other point, do you think? Well, it's the only thing you can do when you're given a point. You have nothing else to do with it. Plug it in. So take 115 and plug that in, please. And then solve this for A, please. 15 minus 40 is going to be negative 15 divided by 1 minus 3.5. It's going to be negative 2.5. When I square that, that's going to be 6.25. Since I'm squaring a negative, it becomes positive. So I'm going to divide by that. What will A become as a result? What is this value? Can somebody give me an approximation at least? It's a little bit more than 2. Sorry, negative 25. I apologize. Thank you. Ah. I did the hard work right, right? The squaring of a decimal and can't subtract. Like, it just, you think about that. Uh, but this is correct, right? 6.25 squared. I just did 25 squared is 6.25. So 2.5 squared is 6.25. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know the trick? You should know that. Like, if you wanted to do 1.4 squared, or sorry, if you wanted to do 1.2 squared, you just do 12 squared. Yeah. Well, squared is 144, so what's 1.2 squared? Uh, 144. Uh, yeah, so if you want to square 2.5, yeah. square 25 yeah. instead. Yeah. And then you can yeah. 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 yeah, I don't ever square. Because 25 squared is 625, so 2.5 is what you get from here, squared is 624. Anyway, what do we get as an answer here? It's going to be 4 exactly? Negative. Negative 4. That worked out nicely, look at that. I, I just completely made this up. So what do we get as a result? We just rewrite what we have in blue there as our final answer, but with the negative 4 in place. Okay, think of the next question. I need to get a drink of water. Think of the next question, guys. Think of the next question. sense at least this problem? Yeah. Okay, the y is i of the function, x is the time, it's going to be h and t instead if you wanted to write it that way. Um, Good, yeah. We haven't gone over this for a while, we've only been imaginary numbers. Sure. Yeah. So first, where do imaginary numbers come from? There's a little theory, a little background. Imaginary numbers come from? Negative. Negative under the? Radical. Radical or square root. Okay, it comes from the solution to this equation right here x squared equals b when b is a negative number. That's where it derived from. Now, all that stuff, you don't have to know derivations, obviously, right? But you should know how to apply them. So we can have imaginary numbers. We can have operations with them. So first, to start, like something like this could be asked in like a simple question where you're using this as part of something where you're, where you're summing it with something else. So let's say uh, something like that. How to go about this one? What do you got? Oops, not negative, sorry. Go ahead, keep going. So that's one example of something you could see. This would be like a one-pointer though, right? At most, so it is one-pointer. Just 
operations with it. It could be operations where you're multiplying. So we have to remember there with binomial conjugates. So another one could look like, let's say, something like this. Okay, we get something like this bridge, where then you have to multiply by three plus i over three plus i. This has to get spoiled out. This has to get distributed to both of these. Okay.